Good morning, my friend. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to Denver, Colorado. Let me have another sip of coffee here, just letting you know that today is a great day. No matter what, what's going on in the world, no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what's going on in our bodies, we all know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all this is His, not ours. When we understand that it's not ours, we take, we release possession of it. We put it in God's hands and by His grace, we're able to live through Jesus Christ and have an abundant life serving Jesus Christ all the days of our life, not having the love of the world in us, but having the love of the Father filled in us because we love the Father. So let me set this coffee down. So as you know, I'm in Denver, so let's just start in prayer and then we'll go after that. We're in chapter one here, which is the opening, the greeting, the uh, some news and some prayer. So let's just, you know, a little bit of news there. We'll go into prayer and we'll go into chapter two. So Lord, I just thank you for allowing me to come out here a little later than normal. I uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you miraculously uh, set up my doctor appointments for my surgery. And I say thank you, Lord, that it wasn't me that set them up, but that it was you that set it all up. And it's just was beyond my understanding how it all fell together so smoothly. Because I trust in you, Lord. I don't trust in my own abilities to get the job done. I trust fully and completely in you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for setting me free uh, from my physical stuff. <laughs> and, um, and I thank you, Lord, for bringing people here to this channel. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you've anointed me to preach the gospel even on this YouTube channel and out here on the street of Denver, Colorado at 17th and Wine Coop here in Union Station. And I say thank you, Lord, for uh, opening the doors that no man can shut, for you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can uh, see heaven unless they come through you, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, and amen, and amen, and amen. So. Uh, a lot of times I'll say things in the beginning that are kind of weird, but uh, let's just, let, right now, let's just close off chapter one and we'll reopen chapter two. <laughs> Welcome to chapter two. You know, uh, a lot of the cities I go to are like little mini vacations. So in chapter two, it says the main title, the subtitle, the letter title, and lesson one, which is the part number for the day that we're doing. So uh, <clears throat> when I woke up this morning, I started thinking about the Word of God. That was one, almost the exact first thought that came to my mind, that came to my mind. And that is, uh, I, I just couldn't, uh, and what came to me, this is what came to me, is I am teaching about the Word of God. That's what the Holy Ghost is having us do. And what startled me, and I'm still laying in bed this morning, I, you know, it was a great night. I, you know, I had a great time in Louisville yesterday. It was really a wonderful trip. Uh, was shocked at a couple things, but uh, we took care of business over there in Louisville, and uh, it was good. But this morning, when I woke up, and my first thought was the Word of God, the Word of God, and the teaching of the Word of God, and coming with the understanding of the Word of God, and knowing who God is. It was truly a an eye-opener to me. What, I, what opened my eyes was the startlement that only a tiny few are following along with what the Holy Ghost is doing. I have thousands and thousands of people that uh, uh, are, are involved in this ministry in one form or another, directly, indirectly, as I'm very visible, okay, and thousands of people. So a lot of people know me that I don't know them. And a lot of people hear me, and I've never met him before. You know, today, a uh, guy met me, uh, gave me a food bar, and says, oh, yeah, you know, I, you know, and this morning on the phone, talking to the doctor's office. Uh, kind of one of my ways I introduce myself now, because you probably heard this in some of the videos, I say, uh, yeah, I'm the big guy that holds the big Jesus sign around town. 
That's what I told the doctor's office, the lady in the office there. And she started laughing because she recognized who I was, <laughs> even though I was on the phone. And uh, it brought a, a laughter to her face. You know, I mean, she wasn't laughing at me at the gospel. She was uh, kind of excited to be talking to me. She's looking forward to seeing me. And that's what I'm guessing. That's what the impression that I got from her. She was interested when I go next Tuesday to the, uh, for consultation on the surgery. So, uh, you know, to be known in your city as the guy who has the big Jesus sign around town. What's, how about that? You know, I get on the bus, you know, the lady on the bus, the guy behind me. Uh, everywhere I go, I'm always dressed for work. I never dress without what you see me at. I'm always working. If I leave that, now I don't wear this in the house, obviously, but uh, this is all under the Word of God. This is all chapter two. But when I walk out of the door, you know, not to take the trash out to get the mail, but when I go someplace, I'm dressed like this, always. And I always have a pocket full of tracks, you know? I always have a pocket full of tracks and all the pocket full of tracks, you know? There's 10 here, I got 10 in my other pocket, I got 20 different cards, and I got plenty of money to pass out to the poor and to invest in people's ministry, and I'm ready to do whatever. You know, I'm ready. I'm always ready. And uh, being ready is one of the attributes of uh, that, that God likes. Uh, because if Satan can come in your life and not get you ready, let's go, it's kind of, you're busy, you're preoccupied, well, I've got this to do and I got this to do, and you know, I'll get around to ministering or I'll get around to reading the Bible. Uh, I'll, you know, uh, give me some time, Lord, and I'll get to you. <laughs> That's the wrong, uh, you know, give me some time, Lord, I'll get to you. You know, put, put God on hold. You know, I remember, <laughs> I thought just came to my mind. I remember reading a cartoon, little one, you know, little drawing, little cartoon, and there was two guys sitting in hell. <laughs> two guys sitting in hell. The guy turns to the other and says, why are you here? And he said, uh, I invented the hold button. <laughs> you know, in my life of trucking, I was put on hold. I've been put on hold probably 5,000 times. I am 40 years, but when I work for the new company, I've been with a lot of companies, uh, once people find out that you don't put Preacher John on hold, because uh, he'll hang up. You put me on hold, I'll wait a minute. You know, I'll wait 60 seconds. Click, I'm done. I got things to do. I haven't got time to sit on the phone with the dispatcher. And I just don't do that. I don't put people on hold, and I don't expect to be put on hold more than a normal a minute, you know. 60, 60, 90 seconds, that's normal. You know, maybe you're on another call or something, but not on two, three, four, five minutes on hold. You know, you get, get back with a person and you tell them, hey, I'm gonna be on the phone with this other guy. I'll call you back when I'm done. Okay, cool, thanks. You know, you honor people's time. I don't care if they're a sinner, they're going to hell. You honor their time, you honor and respect them. You know, I had two ladies in Louisville yesterday, obviously homosexuals, both were hanging on to each other's hand, both in their mid 50s. Uh, one looked like she was pretending to be a man, and one looked like she was pretending to be a girl. Both were girls, both were women. And uh, the one of them said, God bless you. And I said, God bless you. And as they walked across the street, I said, have a great day. And they both stopped in the middle of the street, turned around and said, wow, thank you, we will. I mean, I made a, an impact in their life because I'm gonna be there in six more weeks, same corner. And it looks like they live there gave me an impression that they live there. They'll come back and talk to me again. That, that's being a pastor. Now, if I traveled all these different cities like I used to, uh, like I used to, uh, I would tell them, hey, you know, you know, and I would tell them the truth of their sin because I'd never see them again. See, that's why I don't tell people their sin anymore. I used to, I lived that way all my life. I was, you know, in their face constantly. My wife hated it. You know, my children didn't mind. They didn't, they thought it was kind of cool. But uh, my wife hated it, you know, because I was always in people's face telling them about hell, about sin, about going, you know, you need to receive Christ. But when I became a pastor uh, three years ago, and I'm in a pastor, in, in other words, I'm visible all the time, all the time, on the street. So from now on, I don't put people down. I don't call out their sin. I don't tell them how rotten they are and how they are destined to go to hell. 
because if I do that, I will never have a chance to talk to them again. However, if the Lord quickened me to talk to them about Jesus, I would, no question about it, because I learned that years ago. You know, if God tells you to talk to somebody, you better talk now. You don't go home and pray about it, you talk now. But uh, it's just like those two ladies. You know, I gave them a great big smile. And I said, God bless you, have a great day. And it just shocked them. You could see the literal shock because they stopped right in their tracks in the middle of the street, in the inter, you know, on the crosswalk, and both turned and said, thank you. You too, have a great day, you know. I made a positive impact on their life. I'm touching people for heaven. Next time they come back, they'll see me again. And now, next time, they'll probably stop and talk to me. And I'll be cordial to them. If I'm quickened by the Spirit of God in me, I'll tell them about the gospel. But if I'm not quickened, I won't talk to them about the gospel. I'll just be nice to them. I'll be nice to them. I'll answer their questions. If they have a specific question, I'll answer it. But if they don't have a specific question, I'll just converse with them. I'll make a friend because I'll be back that one location again in six more weeks. I have a six week rotation, so I'm back at the same location. But they could have seen me because I, I, I think there's one or two people, I think there was two, that in Louisville, I think I recognized them from Boulder. And that's what happens. I go to all these different cities. I'm in 13 cities now. And they say, hey, didn't I see you in that city? Or didn't I see you in that city? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I've had a few people say, man, you get around. I said, yeah, I get around, you know? I'm spreading the gospel. I'm building a church in the state of Colorado, not just in one town. It's across the state. How does that work? <laughs> Ask God. I haven't got a clue, but I'm doing what the Lord Ghost told me to do. So this is all under the heading of the Word of God. Uh, I understand who the Word of God is. I'm teaching the Word of God, and I am living in the Word of God, and I'm living under the Word of God, and the Word of God is living in me. Okay, and then under the Word of God, we have our sub-series, and that is titled Breakthrough, Overcome. We're, we are praying, we are fasting, we are moving forward, we're doing what God has told us to do, we're doing what the Word of, the Word of God has told us to do, to have breakthrough in our life, and our ministry, to go into the next season. Sirens, we're living in a world of sirens nowadays. So, uh, I'm gonna plug my ears, because he's right there, sorry. Uh, it's ridiculous. So since that siren, that ambulance just went by, let me give you a clue why there are so many ambulances, so many sirens nowadays, especially in the last two years. Because all these cities are allowing the homeless to live on the street anywhere. And the homeless have physical problems. And so, they have physical problems, and so that's normally where they're going. If they're down that way, there's a lot of homeless on that street, a couple streets down, just like right here. They're all over the place. Uh, they all need to be helped. They're all sick, you know? They're not well. So under the sub breakthrough and uh, overcome, okay? And then uh, the under that is our letter series, and that is uh, uh, Holy Ghost just quickening me to make sure that I remember to read Revelation 19, 13. Uh, uh, but he also said that I can finish my statement. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God loves us so much that we just think God is some tyrant sometimes, or, or God wants us to be in a box. You know, God doesn't want us to be. He wants us to make our own decisions. And it's, like he said, you know, but he'll give us some ideas, okay? It's just amazing. You really have to learn how to live with the Spirit of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, in the letter series, be thou strong and very courageous. It's in Joshua 1, 7. It's kind of a, uh, those verses 7, 8, and 9, those verses right there should be our, our mantra, our, 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 not mantra, but our, our, our medit constant meditation. Everything that we do, we should always kind of go back to those verses. They should actually be kind of jotted down in the New Testament so that you can remind yourself to always go back to those first few verses in Joshua because they are so powerful for us today. So going back to uh, Revelation 19, 13, and I'll read it to you because it's very important to the Holy Ghost. And let me preface this one more time. 
I said this a few times. If you don't, if if, if you don't think that the word of God is important, uh, there may be challenges that you're going through that are stopping you from believing the importance of the word of God, and those challenges are not from God. Uh, they're from Satan. Satan wants to stop you. No question about it. Uh, so. Resist him and humble yourself before the hand of Almighty God. Humble yourself, resist the devil, bind the devils around your life, bind the, the curses on your life, bind the, take authority over evilness in your life. Get the evil out of your life. And do it quickly. Don't mess around with it. I mean, just get, get it done. You wanna live in uh, the goodness of God. You wanna live in a good home and a good environment. You don't want no evil, you want no sin, you don't want none of that stuff because it'll stop you from understanding what this verse right here I'm going to read, why it's so important. I get it. I get why it's important. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Think about that. He was clothed with garments, a vesture, clothes that were dipped in blood. Let me uh, stop right there. I'm going to give a little idea of what the value of that. So uh, I'm from California, born in Los Angeles, San Gabriel, and raised in Reno, Nevada, actually Washoe Valley. And uh, the Hell's Angels are all up and down California, mainly the Southern, but they're all over California. We used to have a chapter, a Hell's Angel chapter in uh, Redding, California. They shut it down long time ago. God bless you. Uh, Hell's Angels, that's the motorcycle group that had the skull and the crossbones, you know. And uh, so to be initiated into the Hell's Angels, one of the things, of one of many things, to be initiated into the Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club is you would have to take your uh, leather, your, uh, wasn't leather, it was a uh, uh, Levi jacket, you know, they cut the sleeves off the Levi jacket, and then they'd just sew on the stuff in there and they sold their patches on. And then, uh, uh, they'd have to put it on the ground and everybody would pee on it. It would be saturated with urine. But their, their, their garment would be dipped in urine. That's the difference, the opposite. See, that's evil. Hell's angels were all about Satan, about devils. So that's what Je that Jesus says, his garments were dipped in the blood of the lamb, made pure and holy. Satan takes their garments and dips it in urine and feces, poop. And then you have to put it on. You don't wash it. You never, ever, Hell's Angel never washes their clothes. Ever. Pretty sickening, huh? But people honor the Hell's Angels. Back in the uh, 60s, movies were made. I, there's four, five, six movies. Big, big, big movies made on the Hell's Angels are like that. Honoring Satan. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, that's a little trivia. <laughs> I was a motorcycle rider, you know, outlaw biker for a while. And, uh, you know, had the leather coat, the chains, and the long hair, and the beard, and everything. Uh, you know. <laughs> My motorcycle never slept outside, it slept in the house. <laughs> yeah, it was always uh, taken care of. It was the number one possession of my life, my bike. You know, in fact, uh, if a girlfriend would come, if she didn't like motorcycles, she wasn't my girlfriend. <laughs> so that's just the way it goes. That's uh, way back when. But uh, I was a dirt bike rider, motocross rider, and a uh, chopper, road choppers. Even worked at the Reno Harley Davidson shop uh, doing odds and ends when I was young. And uh, uh, had several Harleys. <laughs> you never know who you're talking to or who you're listening to, do you? <laughs> Anyways, and he was clothed in a vesture, dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Name is called the Word of God. And then, the, and then I'll finish this chapter up. Uh, as, as you know, my chap, my videos are long, so it's just the way it is. Sorry, I don't mean to say sorry. It's just, uh, uh, just letting you know that I also know that my videos are long. It's just, but every one seems to be different because I listen to all of them. They say I don't seem like I'm copying myself. Every video seems to be pretty fresh. I mean, I don't know, but it just seems that way. So today is Friday. We're going to read Romans 4 
uh, 20, 21, and 22. Romans 4, and I'll just read that real quick, and then we'll teach it in the next chapter. Romans 4, 20, and uh, 22, 22. Um, Romans 4, verse 20, you ready? Okay, we get this right, that's right there. Okay, and he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, um, and being full, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Amen. And Lord, I just thank you for the reading of your word in Jesus' name. I thank you for the reading of your word. So uh, let's, uh, let's close chapter two here and we'll reopen with chapter three. God bless chapter three. So in chapter three, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about breakthrough and we're gonna talk a little bit about overcoming. When you think about breakthrough and you think about overcoming, uh, breakthrough, I liken that image of a wall coming down. And that wall is, is like the walls of Jericho. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. That was one of our letter series titles. Uh, by faith, those walls came down. So that I would call that breakthrough because they went through the wall. After the wall came down, it went straight through right in front of, I mean, they just went right into the city. And uh, Jericho is still with us today. It's been rebuilt many, many times. It's a, uh, they say it's one of the oldest cities in the world. Uh, one of many. And it's still active. That's really interesting how it's still uh, going today. Uh, because there are some cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're no longer in existence. They are dust, ash, and brimstone. And you can go down to the Dead Sea and see the remains of the Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, that's all real stuff. It's still there. You can go to look at it. People say, oh, the Bible's not real. Well, you can read the Bible. Then you can physically go there and physically pick up brimstone, which is nowhere else. It's just right there, you know, in all the different cities. It just wasn't one city. It was a multitude of cities. I think six cities. Sodom was a city. Gomorrah was a city. And it was a, a couple other small settlements in that area. And uh, that's what created the Dead Sea, I think. Uh, forget some of my history there. So uh, that's breakthrough. And so lesson two is we're going to just talk a little bit and uh, go over this topic. There you go, man. <laughs> yeah. What's really great about being a street preacher, for me at least, I don't know about anyone else because I really don't associate with other street preachers other than you, Brian. Uh, God bless Brian. Oh, man. Um, most of the street preachers don't hang around. That we're kind of it seems like most street preachers are kind of loners. Uh, there are some that have little groups, but uh, I have not been fortunate enough to have a small group. I wish I could have a small group, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, it will. I know that for a fact. Uh, I've got uh, I've got gear for everybody if they want to come out with me. I've got shirts for people to wear. I've got hats for people to wear. I've got banners for people to uh, lift up. I even got extra. Uh, safety cones for you. We can all stand at different corners. You know, you don't have to have anything except the love of God, a love of Christ, and want to see souls saved for Jesus Christ. I'll even give you some gospel tracts. I mean, everything you need, I have that God has provided me, and I'll sow it into your life. Because if I sow, I'll reap what I sow, right? You know, if I sew a shirt, because I've sewed several shirts, I've sewed several hats, guess what? I've got new hats coming in for 2022. I'll have some new shirts coming in for 2022. And, uh, because I give, always giving. And I'm always looking to give. So uh, Romans chapter four, uh, verse 20. Now this was a real, this whole section here is really hard to understand. Uh, not hard to understand, but it's extremely, extremely concentrated here. Let me take these off for a second, sorry. Let me just take these off so I can kind of see a little easier because there's a couple things I want to talk about. Now when my glasses is off, I gotta remember to look at the camera lens and not look at myself. So uh, Romans chapter four, verse 20. Uh, here it says, uh, uh, we're talking about Abraham and Sarah. So he refers to Abraham and he staggered, or let's just say Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. So I, when I was reading this this morning, I said stagger. And my first thought was a drunk. So totally drunk or stoned, a drug addict, and they're staggering around. Uh, 
because when you're staggering, you're not in your right mind. And when you're not in your right mind, it's difficult to have faith. It's difficult to believe when you're not in your right mind. It's kind of weird looking. I can't seem to figure out how to do this without my glasses on. Anyways, he staggered not. So he was not divided. He was not out of his mind. He was not intoxicated. He was not uh, filled with evil. Because it says he staggered not. Very important. And I'll let just kind of say this real quick. Uh, in the King James, in legal ease English, legal English, this is classical English, this is world international English, I guess you could say, is that uh, they put the most important words first, then the secondary words second. In uh, American English, we put the unimportant words first, and then the important words last. <laughs> they flip it around. That's why a lot of people can't read the King James nowadays because they're so watered down with, with, uh, with poor English. Poor English. That's why when we, we listen to people from India or from uh, different areas in the country, China and Japan, different Asian countries, when they speak English, they speak perfect English. But Americans don't speak perfect English. We speak a slandered, slanted, uh, sloppy English. And so Bibles are being written in a sloppy fashion to match sloppy Americans. How sad, right? That's why people can't read the King James nowadays, you know, because those who have, they have you know, people are 30 years old who have grown up, maybe 20 years old, 30 years old, have grown up with sloppy English. So they have to read a sloppy English Bible so it makes sense. That's why this is so difficult. But this is why it should be important, because when you read this, you'll read proper English. <laughs> if that's important. <laughs> Anyways, he staggered not at the promise of God. Right there, you have to know what the promise of God is. What's our promise, right? I mean, think about it. We have a lot of promises, right? You know, through unbelief. So staggering is the same as unbelief. When you have unbelief, you stagger. You go, you know, you're staggering. And a staggering man will fall. That's how they fall. They stagger. Unbelief creates a divided mind. You either believe or you don't believe. That's the divided mind, and every divided house will fall. Your house will fall if you stagger at the promises of God. If you question and you doubt the promises of God in your life, you will fall. You will fall. And if you fall, if you fall, the Bible says, and great is that fall. I hope that gets you to stop and maybe even pause the video and think about that. Because if you stagger because you, un you don't believe the promise of God and you fall, the Bible says that great is that fall because that's a house that's built on sand. Now your house may look gorgeous. You might have a new roof on it. You may have new shutters. You may have a fresh coat of paint, new lawn. Uh, it may just look gorgeous from the outside. Even if you go inside, you have new carpet, you have new drapes, you have new furniture. You even go into the kitchen, you got new utensils. I mean, the house even smells new. You know, new air conditioning, new heat pump, new wiring, new everything. It's all been rebuilt. It's brand new. But what you don't see in that house is the foundation. You don't see the foundation. It's one of the first things when you buy a house, you, you have to go into the crawl space. You have to go down and under the foundation and have the foundation inspected. Because the house could be, look beautiful, but if the foundation is cracked, if the foundation is not solid, the house is gonna come down. You know, you might buy a beautiful house, but that foundation will allow the house to crumble. That's why the foundation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we don't build another foundation. You don't build another foundation. Our foundation is on the rock of Jesus Christ, okay? And when you have that foundation, you don't have unbelief. And if you did, cast it out. Ask God to help you to, uh, to uh, get that away from you. I'm gonna turn that a little bit. I love coming to these towns because it makes me feel like I'm on a vacation because this is in Boulder. 
When I'm not in Boulder, I'm working in Boulder. That's my home. Little fire truck. Anyways, uh, he staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. Because if you have unbelief, you do not have faith. If you have faith, then you don't have unbelief. You have faith. Faith displaces unbelief. That's how you get saved. You know, if you don't believe in Christ, then you have doubt and you have unbelief. You don't have faith. But somehow or another, you've got to, uh, somehow or another, and it really is, that's why I call a salvation a miracle. Uh, <laughs> because uh, you have to kind of move out of that unbelief for a moment and hope that Jesus and the story about Jesus and what he did for us is true. You just have to be there just for a moment and believe that God is real. And then in that small moment of time uh, that you're kind of away from that unbelief and that doubt, you stepped away from your sin, you stepped away from all that junk. That's why I tell people to go quietly into your own bedroom, shut the door, or into your kitchen, or in your bathroom, or go out in the woods and just by yourself, ask God to save you. Uh, that's, sometimes I think that's the most important way because it's just you and Jesus. It's you and God, that's it. And uh, so in that little sliver of uh, timeline of, of uh, uh, without unbelief, you have a little bit of faith, a little bit of faith because God sees what you're doing. And you say, like I said, when I was laying in my bunk aboard uh, USS Regal, AF-58, operations department, I said, Jesus, if you're real, here I am. That changed my life. That changed my life. That changed my life. Uh, and I'm still living that today. Still living that today. And that is what salvation is all about. Because after you move into that little bit of sliver of time that uh, you receive Christ, you continue moving in faith. That's why uh, it is so dramatic when you become born again. Because just moments ago, before the prayer, you had unbelief. You didn't. You doubted God. That was all a lie to you. That was all phony, fake, stupid. I used to call Christians. I wouldn't hear Christian. I thought they had to be a sissy to be a Christian, and I didn't consider myself a sissy. <laughs> I was too hardcore. And then all of a sudden, you're saved, and because it's such a, and you can see that transition point right there where you receive Christ. And you can just seem like that was like a, a Jordan River experience. That was like you crossed through the Red Sea. It's like a, a point of time that you received a new life. And that's why you should never forget your born again experience. You all have, always have that testimony on the lips when you talk to people. I tell that testimony all the time, probably 10,000 times in 48 years I've told that testimony because it's so real for me, it's so real. <laughs> Anyways, I, uh, you know, I know I went a long time there, but uh, let's just kind of go through a little bit more here. Uh, but it was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's what'll happen when you, when we have breakthrough, when we overcome, we'll give glory to God. But we start giving glory now, because we've already, we're well able. Praise Jesus. Uh, praise Jesus, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then uh, when you get saved, you start giving glory to God. I'm over here because this is the part you got saved. This is the part your unbelief. <laughs> However that works out. <laughs> Amen. I never wore this bright green shirt downtown here. I usually kind of wear a muted shirt. I don't know why. The Lord wanted me to wear this shirt today. I have seven colors and I wear a different color based on what the Holy Spirit showed me in the morning when I was praying for the corner. And this is what I saw put on. This is not normal. I normally don't wear this bright green shirt. Downtown. Denver. Uh, giving glory uh, number 21 and being fully persuaded being fully persuaded we have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's promise and God's calling our life is sure we have to know for a fact that our salvation is sure not questionable gee am I saved or am I not saved too many believers are walking around with the idea well man I, I hope I'm saved I'm not sure if I'm saved gee what happens if I died I mean I, what kind of life is that to not to not know you're saved? You have to be fully persuaded. And how do you get persuaded? You have to listen to authority. You don't listen to man. 
Forget, stop talking to man and asking him about your salvation. Talk to God. And when you talk to God, pick up a King James Bible and read the Bible and with God, and you will be persuaded. The Holy Spirit will persuade you, will make it so sure in your life that you'll not doubt that you're saved or that you have the promises of God. Uh, okay, uh, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, like we have promised that God's gonna bring us home when we die. He was well able also to perform. You had to be fully persuaded that God is able to do what he told you he's gonna do. For example, this is a hard example, but this is my example, and that is God says he's gonna build Gospel Evangelist Church. Okay, no man's gonna build Gospel Evangelist Church here in Boulder, in Colorado. Uh, and so I have to be fully persuaded that God's gonna do that. I have to fully believe that he's gonna perform that act. I have to know for a fact I can't question it, I can't doubt it. I have to walk fully by faith. And so later on, we can say once that church is built, we see it physically. I mean, we see it physically now, but it's not the idea of what I, not the vision that I see. It's in the, just the <laughs> seed form right now, it seems like. But it is growing, it has been planted, and it is sprouting. That's what's really cool. So as a new plant sprouts, like GEC is sprouting out of the ground, I have to protect it. Why do I have to protect it? Okay, I have to protect it because in springtime, the sprouts come up. But it's not spring, it's winter. <laughs> do you get it? If you're a gardener, like I am, uh, you get it. You say, oh my goodness, I have sprouts coming up and it's, it's not spring. Somehow or another, the seed got mixed up in its timing. It's supposed to come up in springtime, but it's coming up at the fall time. So it's way off several months. So what do you do is you get a bunch of straw. You get a bunch of stuff to, to cover it and protect it the best you can. Uh, sometimes you can uh, dig it up and put it in a, another pot or dig it up and put it in the garage or something like that. Uh, uh, some of my bushes, I would you know trim them way back and I'd cover them with straw and sometimes cover them with, you know, gar uh, with uh, a uh, canvas uh, so it, it would protect it from the frost and the freeze uh, and hope that they wouldn't freeze in the winter. And uh, lo and behold, many of my plants uh, that always came up. I, I was able to take annuals that would die every year. Uh, I had annuals that would live for three or four years. Annuals, <laughs> you know, they're supposed to die. But I was able to nurse them through those, those hard winters and then they would come up again. So I treated my annual flowers like perennials. Perennials, they just grow anyways. They're, just, they're, they're programmed to grow, regrow again the next year. But an annual only grows and blooms one year. And uh, uh, so that's what Gospel Evangelist is. That's why we're having breakthrough. That's why the Holy Spirit said, Pre prepare, be prepared to go through the winter until you have your breakthrough in spring. So now I'm having to get straw. I have to get uh, uh, stuff to protect my new plant of GEC that's already sprouted. So I have to protect it. The reason I have to protect is because this big old wall that's looming over us is called failure. And if I allow that little sprout to be destroyed this winter, freeze and be killed, uh, uh, it, might, uh, it, it could affect me a lot. It could affect this ministry a lot. So we're, you know, uh, this is a word for our church and this is a word for anybody who's building our new ministry. Uh, I'm looking forward to re-listening to this video because I'm saying something I think is really important. Uh, um, God's a gardener, okay? He built a garden. One of the first things he built on earth was a garden. <laughs> you know, he has gardens in heaven. God is a gardener. And so when you use gardening terms and gardening thoughts, gardening uh, jargon, uh, the Word of God is like a seed. You know, in a fruit, it has the seed after its own kind. There's a lot of gardening terms in here. Uh, not many ranching terms. Not many, uh, there are some uh, shepherding uh, terminology in there. You know, sheep men and cattle men don't go together because the sheep eat the plants and the root of the pasture. They eat it all. Where cattle just eat the 
plant and no and leave the roots alone so the plant will come back up so when you have sheep out in fields uh, they eat all the uh, uh, wild grass and and so nothing ever grows there again that's why cattlemen and sheepmen don't mix uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said that but uh, anyways so let's go on a little bit more uh, Man, I'm excited. <laughs> My abdomen is hurting too. I'm excited. I am so fired up. I hope you're fired up about your ministry. I hope you're fired up about doing the works of the ministry. I mean, I go fired up about reading the Word, but fired up, excited to go tell somebody about Jesus. Man, I got a chance to witness to three people on the bus. And there's only five people on the bus, but three of them I got a chance to witness to. I mean, that's just amazing, man, that God just uses me all the time all the time it's just amazing I and mean, even doing this video I've had a chance to be witnessing to people see my sign is right up here it's laying up there so people can see the sign while I'm doing my banner here I'm doing my video okay and people look over people read it. people stop and look to me and look at the sign and watch me do the video and walk on and uh, it's, it's wonderful it, it's so wonderful uh, to watch people interact with a minister it gets you so excited, especially if you love Jesus. Uh, if you love Jesus, you want others to receive Jesus. And the only way to do that is you got to go tell people about Jesus. And you can't trust that, oh, well, uh, the radio show will tell them, or the TV show will tell them, or maybe uh, something will go on. you got to tell them, man. Go out and tell people about Jesus, okay? You know, the guy sitting behind me in the bus, I gave him a gospel track. Uh, after we talked for a minute, I talked for, uh, before he got on the bus, he moved over and sat behind me. Uh, he gave me a food bar. God bless you, sir. Didn't get his first name. Uh, and I reached back and gave him a gospel track. And he sat reading that gospel track for about 20 minutes. I, kept, I see that I was reading my Bible, listening to my podcast as I was going down the uh, road. It's about 45, 50 minutes to Denver here. And uh, he read the whole thing, put in his, put in his uh, pack. And uh, I thought, wow, wow. It just made me feel so good because, uh, you know, he was probably in his 60s and a uh, homeless guy. Uh, but, but he might not have been. You know, he had his own bicycle. He might have just, you know, I don't know that for a fact. It's hard now to tell people from homeless people and regular people. <laughs> they seem to all kind of gel together, sounds like. But it just made me feel so good sitting there for those 45 minutes while I was, he was reading that gospel track. It was just uh, such a joy, such a joy. Uh, verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Because he believed, because Abraham believed, that was because, so that, act of believing the promise it says here therefore was imputed to Abraham for righteousness okay that's why father Abraham is called the father of faith and 23 I'm gonna keep reading a little bit farther because I want to get this in the video now it was not written for his sake alone understand that this section of the Bible here Romans 4 actually 4 uh, and uh, four, five, and 5 4 and 5 actually covers this topic it wasn't just written for Abraham, it says here. Uh, for, uh, uh, now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, I, Abraham. However, in 24, but for us also, for you and I, it was written for us. And that's where I get the verses that I tell people uh, that the stories in the Old Testament are not just for the stories in the Old Testament. The stories are for us today also. Not all of them, but some of them. You know, and the Holy Spirit tells us which ones are for us and which ones are not for us. You know, I use the example of, well, we don't do blood sacrifice anymore. You know, that's not for us. That was for back then, not for now, okay? But this here, talking about righteousness, is for us. You know, we don't do what Abraham did to Isaac. We don't take Ab our, our son, our firstborn son up to the mountain with a knife and try to you know, sacrifice him. We don't do that, you know, uh, but that was what he did. That was what asked, you know, anyways. For us also to whom it shall be imputed for righteousness. That's how we receive our righteousness, by belief, you know. And uh, it's just the same way. 
Yeah. Same, all, this is so important to get it. I'm sorry I'm not very much of a good talker. I'm, I'm just a, I, I'm not an elegant talker. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I just go with it. Uh, uh, I tried college five times and I flunked all five times. I finally gave up on the fifth time, bought myself a truck and went trucking. And that's why I stayed in the truck. And then in school, uh, from about seventh grade on, uh, I just could not get schooling. Uh, in third grade, I was taken out of third grade and put in the uh, uh, retard class and uh, disability class because I couldn't get it. You know, in third grade, I got scarlatina fever and almost died. So I spent about a year and a half uh, in home uh, being tutored by the with a third grade tutor because I couldn't go to school. I had to. Yeah, you know, I was dying, you know, but I didn't die. And uh, but from then on, I uh, the fever, the scarlatina fever, uh, did something to my third grade brain. However old you are when you're in third grade, and uh, uh, I'm still that way. It's still, uh, it's just because when I hear people that are smart who have a good, clear brain, they talk so eloquently to me. But for me, it's just it's not the same. So. I, I apologize for not for stumbling around. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So we will receive the righteousness if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I circle this believer, I put a point here, because it does not say if we repent on him that raised up Jesus. It says we have to believe. Uh, once we believe, that's the first act of read and receive. Once we believe, we receive Christ. If we go back, if we go into sin, then we have to turn away from that sin. But you cannot turn away from that sin because that's a work. You cannot turn away from that sin and then receive Christ. You have to believe Christ. You know, you become born again, and then you uh, go on from there. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 from the dead. Who is, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to stop right there. So let me read 24 one more time. But for, also, but for us also to him it shall be imputed if we believe on him, Jesus Christ, no, actually on God, believe on God that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Man, what a verse. I hope I made sense. I don't feel like right now I made any sense at all. I was uh, talking about this. I certainly, it, it seems like I just made no sense whatsoever. And uh, uh, this verse goes all the way through to, uh, th through the first several chap first verses of chapter five too. Um, uh, so I'm gonna stop that right there. That's lesson two, chapter. So let's close chapter three and we'll reopen in chapter four. God bless chapter four. God bless chapter four. So God bless chapter four. God bless preacher John, man. Um, you know, I love Jesus with all my heart and I'm so grateful that he's given me life because my, one of my good, 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 good friends who helped support this ministry, in fact, the man who bought the camera that you're watching this video on uh, died last week. Barry from Golden, Colorado. He was a very famous ski instructor and uh, he instructed kings and princesses and heads of state from all over the world, their children and their parents. It just was a, uh, spent a whole life being a ski instructor, some of the world's most famous ski resorts here in America. And uh, he was a great man to me. And he was a great man to God because now he's with Jesus. He had Parkinson's disease and that's what took him out. Uh, but he's not hurting anymore. Barry and I had our last supper. Uh, last, uh, I think we had it in uh, September because in October, I go there the second Friday of every month, September. Uh, he could not meet me in September. So that's when he texted John, I can't meet you today. I cannot see. I was, he went blind the last, uh, that last month. And then in October, I texted him again and he blessed me in a text and that was October 18th. And I still have the couple more texts after that, which he never answered because he wasn't here. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes when people die, it takes, uh, takes a while to overcome it. The Bible says he gives us 30 days to mourn. And that's when Moses died. Uh, God gave the people 30 days to mourn for the death of Moses. So it might take me 30 days to overcome Barry's death. But you're watching this camera, this video, on a tool that Barry bought and invested into this ministry so that you, my friend, can watch this. Because this camera is working, and the last camera I had, that old camera I had, wasn't working, kept crashing on me. And he wanted to bless this ministry. Seems like such a small thing, but uh, to me it's a big thing. And now I've got hundreds of videos because of Barry, and uh, we'll go on even though Barry's not with us anymore. 54 years old. I think he was 54. I think that's the last age he told me. Or he was going to be 54 or maybe 53. But, uh, that's the recap. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because everything else doesn't matter. If you know all this Bible and you're not saved, you're still going to go to hell. You can know every single word. You can have all 31,102 verses memorized, verbatim. I've talked to people in my ministry on the streets and uh, different places I've been in the world. And I've talked to people face to face and tested them. They knew the Bible. They had photographic memories, these people I'm thinking about photographic memories. They literally photographed in their brain every word of the Bible. Didn't matter what verse I turned to. King James, too. All The two people I'm thinking about, King James. They had to memorize every single word verbatim. It was a miracle. But some people have those photographic type memories. But when you ask them, do you know Jesus? Said, no. Just a good book. Good his historical book. It was fun to memorize. That's what I did, you know. So you can memorize every word and never know uh, the salvation that Jesus so rightfully and so beautifully and so wonderfully gave us freely. It's a free gift. The Word of God. <laughs> the Word. I just noticed that on the camera. The Word of God. Wow. I just noticed that. That's Revelation 19:13, the Word of God. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you that you are so beautiful to us, that you will demonstrate miracles and we don't even know that you're showing us a miracle until we notice it. Because maybe we didn't have eyes to see, but then all of a sudden, you open our eyes of our understanding, just like now, and I just noticed it just now, Lord. I just noticed it, that you had me put the Word of God on this book. And that's the verse that you've been telling me all these last several weeks how important it was. Thank you, Lord. The Word of God. Help the people, Lord. Help the people, Lord. Touch the people, Lord. Touch them. Touch them. Heal them, Lord. Where they're sick, heal them. Where they're unable, heal them to be able. Whatever they need, Lord, give them whatever they need so they can do something for the kingdom of God. Lord, give them boldness to preach the gospel. Lord, give them power to be a witness and to testify of the mighty works of God. Lord, if they're being persecuted by a devil, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I cast that devil out. In Jesus' name, be gone. And I pray the blood of Jesus Christ where that devil was. And I pray the word of God into that area in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that you're calling people to your ministry. You're calling people to your harvest. You're calling people out to the field. You're calling people to be prayer warriors. You're calling people to stand up and take a stand for Christ. You're calling people to stand for Jesus Christ. You're calling people now to do all kinds of great works for your kingdom. You're calling people to stand on the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of Christ. You're calling people to stand strong and mighty as flame, ministers of flaming fire. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we burn for Christ. Our light never goes out and will never be extinguished. We will live 
forever and ever with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I hope you get it, my man. I hope you get what the Lord is trying to do. I hope you get everything that God is desiring in your life. I hope that the anchor to your life is Jesus Christ. I hope that Jesus is big in your life. I hope the Word of God is powerful and sharp in your life, always cutting out those things that the world keeps putting into your life, that the Word of God is mighty in your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and if you're still here, or you've clicked to chapter 4, I want to say to you that I'm doing this because I love you. Even though I don't know you, and you don't personally know me, for whatever reason, however this works, God has put a love in my heart for you. And I cannot express it well enough to say uh, why that love is in me, except that John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that He gave. And when God so loved me that He put the love in me to people, for people. And I honestly, with all my heart, standing before Jesus Christ, say to you that I, John Shuck, loved you. I love you, my man. I love you, my man. I love you. I love you. And I say my man, mankind, male and female, because I don't know everyone who watches this show. I don't know everyone personally, but I love you. I hope you understand that there is somebody in this world that truly loves you, and I'm not just mouthing that. And if you need anything, anything at all, get a hold of me, and we'll see what we can do. I mean, I don't have a lot of anything, but God has it all, and maybe I can help pray with you or whatever you need. Uh, I had a phone call from Poland this morning. Poland. I thought, wow, I better answer this because I've never got a call from another country. Uh, I've had a call from Israel one time, and this is my second call uh, from Poland, but because I'm all over the internet, uh, I thought maybe this is somebody calling me. Uh, it turned out to be a uh, you know a spam call, you know, an advertising call, but I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> so if you're from Poland and you need somebody to talk to, uh, I even have people who are watching me from Nigeria. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> we have two Nigerian gifts of God in our church, two Nigerian gifts from God. God has placed in our church two gifts. Wow, amazing gifts. So uh, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.